Good evening. Welcome to the June 15, 2021 Education and Pupil Services Committee meetings and the Finance and Operations Committee virtual meeting. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. During this unprecedented time, while social distancing requirements are in place, the Upper Darby School District needs to continue certain aspects of its business, which includes decisions concerning pandemic planning. For this reason, the Upper Darby School District will continue regularly scheduled school board meetings while pandemic-related restrictions imposed by Governor Wolf and any local authorities are still in place. It is the plan of the school board to hold these meetings with the minimum required departures from normal operating procedures. The Upper Darby School District School Board COVID-19 Special Operating Procedures document outlines expected departures from those normal operating procedures and the policy justification for such departures. At the start of each committee meeting held while pandemic-related restrictions are in place, the board will review the departures from normal operating procedures as well as their justifications. While social distancing requirements are in place, the Upper Darby School Board finds it necessary to hold virtual school board and school board committee meetings to complete required business. These virtual meetings will allow for public viewing and participation. Following practices already in place for regular meetings, all virtual school board meetings, in addition to allowing near real-time public viewing and participation, will be recorded and the recordings made available after the meeting. In order to hold virtual school board meetings, adjustments need to be made following existing board policy. These adjustments have been outlined in the Upper Darby School District School Board COVID-19 Special Operating Procedures. Dr. McGarry, can you educate the public on how they can participate in tonight's meeting, sir? Yes, thank you, Board President Brown. Thank you for everybody who's uh, viewing this meeting this evening. There are three, me three different meetings this evening. We will begin with an Education and Pupil Services meeting, followed by, uh, we'll follow that with a Finance and Operations, and then there's a special voting meeting to adopt uh, a final budget. Uh, and I'll go through each one of the steps for each one of those meetings. For the Education and Pupil Services meeting and the Finance and Operations, you can phone in your uh, question or comment to 610-789-7200. Again, 610-789-7200, extension 2000. Please leave your name and your address and make sure that you let us know which particular agenda item for which particular report this evening you would like to question or comment on. It's very important that you tell us which specific agenda item. Again, your name, address, and the agenda item, and the board and the administration will do their best to answer your questions before moving on. Following those two meetings this evening, there's also, <clears throat> um, uh, there's also an email, I'm sorry, an email address, which is uh, committeequestions at upperdarbysd.org. Again, committeequestions at upperdarbysd.org. You can also similar to leaving a voice message, provide your name, address, and the specific report and agenda item you'd like to comment on. And again, we'll do our best to answer those questions. Following the finance and operations meeting, there will be a special uh, voting meeting to adopt a budget. You can please uh, call in at 610-789-7200, extension 2000. Again, please leave your name, your address, and in this particular situation, it's comment, and the board will take your comments into consideration. You can also provide an email at board meeting comments at upperdarbysd.org. Again, please provide your name, address, and the uh, a, a report or item you'd like to comment on this evening. The board will take that into consideration before taking action. Thank you, Board President Brown. Thank you, Dr. McGarry. Please feel free to uh, revisit that at your discretion throughout the evening, sir. The meeting of the Education and People Services Committee will please come to order. Roll call, Board Secretary, Mr. Rogers, please. Dr. Haig. Present. Mr. Desnoyers. I am present. Mr. Warsavage. I am present and can hear the proceedings. Mr. Neal. I am present and can hear the proceedings. Mrs. Williams. Here. Mr. Fields. Present. Mrs. Mitchell. Present. Mrs. Curry. Present. Mr. Brown. Present. Thank you, sir. The following motion shall be applicable for tonight's committee meetings and special board meeting. Policy 003 allows the board to suspend policies or parts of policies when appropriate. 
Therefore, due to the current ongoing crisis, I make the following motions to suspend language in two of the board's policies for tonight's committee meetings and special board meeting. Policy 006.1, which regulates attendance at meetings via electronic communications, I move to suspend the language requiring board members to be present. Specifically, the language would be, a majority of board members shall be physically present at a board meeting when a board member attends through electronic communications. In policy 006, which governs other requirements of board meetings, I move the suspension of language requiring that those members of the public wishing to participate be present. Specifically, the language in the section titled, public participation would remove the words that read, present at a board meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed, please signify by saying I oppose and state your name for the record. Anyone abstaining, please say I abstain and state your name for the record. That motion carries. I will now turn over the Education and People Services Committee agenda to co-chair Mrs. Mitchell. Thank you, President Brown. Hello, Ms. Kelly. Um, if you could um, review the agenda items that we'll be discussing tonight. Good evening, everyone. Um, tonight we have three items on the agenda. The first item um, is informational. It's the PSBA uh, legislative platform that Mrs. Uh, Gina Curry and Mrs. Rachel Mitchell will present. The second item is the Upper Darby School District 2021-2024 Comprehensive Plan. It's informational also, and Mr. Marshallak and I will be presenting that plan. And then the third item on the agenda is um, the policy um, which would re require board action to move forward, um, which is policy 246, which is school wellness. Thank you, Mrs. Kelly. And I guess we'll proceed with the first agenda item, which is the Pennsylvania School Board's Association platform submission discussion. Um, as you have maybe heard, Mrs. Curry has been talking about the PSBA platform um, that was submitted for the previous legislative session. So tonight we're just going to talk a little bit about how if our board wanted to submit a platform proposal, how they could do it. And if the board chooses to, we would like to appoint three people tonight who would um, then bring a um, proposal back to the board and we'll talk about the timeline. So if you could go to the next slide. So these, um, the consideration is to form a PSBA platform committee um, and we're going to discuss what is a platform um, proposal, why would our board want to submit a platform proposal, and how we submit it. So I'm going to hand it over to Mrs. Curry. Thank you, Mrs. Mitchell. Uh, good evening. <clears throat> so the considerations um, for to form a PSBA platform are as such. Um, what is a PSBA platform proposal is what we're going to talk about. And we're actually, I'm actually going to show um, the board why it's important to be a part of this process. So if you could go to the next slide. What is a PSBA platform proposal? The legislative platform is a series of statements that serves as PSBA's official record of positions on legislative issues and is the guide for the association's advocacy efforts. And um, I just want to talk briefly about um, why it's really important for us to consider it at this time and how we would go about it. Um, we would um, basically bring, come together as a committee and bring an issue up that we felt um, would be good for the committee um, to bring to the platform. So how do we go about this? Um, we get together as a board, and as um, Mrs. Mitchell explained, we um, will come together and form this committee, and it's a pretty quick process because PSBA works pretty fast in terms of how to submit it. Um, and so now is the, uh, is the time because the actual deadline for the um, platform to be submitted is July 23rd. So... If we are going to um, process this tonight and if our board um, decides that we want to go forward with forming this committee, um, we will have to vote on it in our next meeting on the 13th of July, our next voting meeting, and then we would have to get together that week to come together as a committee. So 
we would be responsible for a few things um, as we go into this. And um, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Mrs. Mitchell to explain that. What you're going to be doing is um, on slide four, you can see you would be reviewing the current PSBA platform and looking at where there would be opportunities to, to either support a current platform position or, um, or submit a new platform decision. So how do we submit an item? Well, all proposals must be approved by the full board. That's all nine of us and verified by our board secretary. In other words, an individual board member can't submit a platform position on their own. Um, proposals and accompanying rationale can be submitted to the PSBA in two, way, two ways. You can use the online submission um, form at, or you can submit um, the platform position document and email it. And the timeline, Ms. Curry sort of already went over it. We would like to form a three-person committee tonight to recommend a platform proposal for consideration or decide that we don't want to move forward. Um, and then you would be submitting that um, information and maybe a, a very small presentation to the full board on, at the July 13th board meeting. And the submission, the final submission would have to be submitted to PSBA by July 23rd. So it's a very short timeline. Gina, if you want to close us up. Yes. Um, if you could go back one slide. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So um, just to uh, reiterate, we want to make sure that the board knows that the boards may voice support for the continuation of a current platform issue. And um, a lot of times on the platform committee, I've been on the platform committee, um, there are issues that come up that during the delegation that is scheduled to happen um, October 23rd this year on a hybrid. Um, basically, there are oftentimes um, you'll see that some of the platform issues will be tabled and they'll have to go back to the platform to go all over again. So you can voice your opinion or your support for that in your own or you can create a topic that we want to see um, actually fought through the legislation, legislation um, advocacy at the PSBA government affairs. And so that's why it's really important um, for us, I feel, in Upper Darby to get involved. Um, so step one, like we said, um, if you could go to the next slide, to the timeline. There we go. Um, so, and to the next slide, I'm sorry. The step one is to form this committee and to um, draft the proposed platform. And step two would be to, to um, have it get to the delegate assembly, um, which would have to be approved in September. Um, and then it would go to the platform. So I feel like at this point, if we um, as a board decide that this is something that we wanna do, I feel like we have fought really hard for the children here in Upper Darby and to see um, a platform issue get to the legislative advocacy um, point in the governmental affairs through PSBA would be um, pretty amazing for our community. So Mrs. Mitchell. Or just one more point of clarification for the public is once the board submits something to this platform committee, each board gets um, a, a number of delegates depending on um, how many students they have. I believe there's a, there's a formula um, for instance, our board is allowed to have three um, people at the platform voting meeting. And so it, it brings boards together from all over the state to decide what we're going to collectively, as every school board in the Commonwealth, are going to fight for in this next legislative session. So do any board members have any questions about this um, or people who might be interested in helping in the next <laughs> month? Sure. <laughs> Mr. Desnoyers, go ahead. Your mic. Mic, please. Oh, sorry. Gosh. It's been so long since I've attended a meeting in person. I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so I have uh, two things. Um, first, can this platform committee of our board be more than three board members? Um, and second, I would be interested in 
uh, I would be would be happy to serve on the platform committee. I suppose no. it could be four, but we definitely can have a quorum. Okay. Um, we sort of thought three, you know, would would be um, the best way forward. But I mean, certainly, if four people say they want to help in the next month, um, we'd be happy to have them. So, anyone have any other questions or want to raise their hand? to um, help. I don't know, Ms. Buford, are there any comments from the board members that are joining us virtually? No, I don't see any requests at this time. Okay. Anybody willing to serve in the next month with Ms. Curry, who I think will probably lead this since she has the most experience on the delegate assembly? So we just have one. Um, Hi, Mrs. Mitchell. Oh, yes. Hello, Mr. War Savage. I, I would be interested uh, in serving on the committee at the, board, at the board's pleasure. Great. Thank you, Mr. War Savage. And thank you, Mr. Dustin Myers. And, and just, I mean, we'll review it at the end, but just be thinking, do we really want to do this? So we have three volunteers, and we just want to make sure that we want to do this on this short time frame, or maybe we want to plan to do it for the following year. So be thinking about that um, for when we review the agenda items. So at this time, I think we can move forward to the next agenda item. Thank you for advancing the slides for us, Christine. So we're going to move on to item number two, which is um, Upper Darby School District 2124 um, Comprehensive Plan. This is an informational item tonight. <clears throat> I'm not ready to present that. I'm not presenting the budget. <laughs> As we're waiting for the slides to come up, so um, the district comprehensive plan, uh, Mr. Marshallack and I will present uh, the three-year um, comprehensive plan beginning um, in for the 20, 2021 school year, um, if approved um, at a later date, which we'll get, review the timeline as well. This will be used um, to provide a framework for our work throughout the district for the years to come. I would like to begin um, with the agenda and highlight the work that has gone into the planning process. Um, Mr. Marshallack and I um, began this work back in uh, t November of 2019, and we had a training on using um, the new comprehensive planning tool, which focused our work on the Future Ready Index. So tonight we'll go over that, pr that process. We'll review the mission and vision statements and how we came to that, um, the strengths, challenges, and goal setting, and review how um, the plan works to feed um, through all of these uh, bullets up here. Um, we will then review next steps and the review process for the um, board and the public. Um, the online tool, which I said was new, of course, allows for more flexibility for districts. It allows for um, data to be reviewed for our own district and focuses on the long-term goals and actionable steps for, um, to obtain those goals. Um, before I begin with the presentation, I want to take a moment to thank um, the members of our steering team. So our work um, on the plan would not have been possible without the help of many people. Um, we had team leaders um, because we had to move to a more virtual setting, so we had some breakout sessions. We also had board members that served on our team, so thank you. We had building principals, curriculum supervisors, teachers, parents, and community, community members also that lent a great deal of time and work and um, a full understanding of how to analyze all the data and everything. So we wanted to say thank you to everybody that did contribute to this process. It was a, it was a lot of hours that um, went into the planning and preparation here. I now want to shift to the process and the timeline that we did use for this. So again, our work began um, back in January of 2020, um, where we started with biweekly meetings um, with our entire planning team. Our first meeting um, was based on the PDE's um, established timeline. And then once the pandemic set um, in, we had to pause our work and adjust our timeline, and we used the guidance from PDE also to do that as well. Um, this was for all phase two schools. So our planning that we are in right now is for a phase two school, which is indicated by PDE as well. Um, after that, we um, readjusted our time, timeline um, to meet the deadline of a November of 2021 um, deadline. 
And based on the guidance, we reconvened um, our committee and began our work back in January of 2021 um, with our entire planning team. Again, all virtual meetings um, with breakout sessions and um, Google Meets and everything else. And our goal the entire time was to try to get it to this June um, committee meeting because what has to happen is a review from the board and the public and we wanted to try to have in place for the new school year a comprehensive plan to begin the school year for 2021. So that's why we were looking for early approval of this plan. That's why we are here tonight asking for um, permission to begin the 28-day review. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Marshallak, who's going to review the mission and the vision statements. Okay. So one of the first uh, components of the planning process was developing a mission statement and a vision statement to guide the work that the uh, comprehensive planning team was going to do um, as they you know, work through the data and develop the action plans. Um, at the same time, you know, before the pandemic, you know, Dr. McGarry, myself, Dr. Council, you know, we go to Penn for our professional developments uh, you know, at the time was once a month. And one of the uh, present presentations was on something called Portrait of a Graduate. Um, and a lot of the work that was based on, it carried over from the previous year um, with the Penn Study Council with what do employers and what do uh, individuals and corporations want our graduates to look like and the skills they need to acquire when they leave high school and beyond to become successful members of a, of a global, global economy. And it's not to say that math and reading and science were not important factors, but they named these, these types of competencies and uh, 21st century skills that they, all, that they believed was very important for graduates to have leaving high school and beyond. Um, so one of the first exercises we did and when developing our mission statement was going through that activity you know, with our comprehensive planning team. Um, they were provided a list um, of a, a number of competencies um, that they were going to you know, go through, talk about, and in their small groups with their team leader, they had to identify <coughs> uh, specific characteristics or attributes they believe was important for our high school graduates to have when they leave um, our, our, our high school. So with that, the next step was, you know, Christine and I went through, we you know, kind of collected all the data and we selected uh, the most common attributes or competencies that were selected by the independent groups or the, 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 the groups. And you can see threaded through our, our mission statement, um, highlighted in yellow or gold, are the, uh, the competencies that were picked by our comprehensive planning team. Now the goal or the purpose of the mission statement is to you know, help keep the LEA focused on the efforts um, the, on their targets that they're going to set through the comprehensive planning process. This would be the how-to if you would, um, for, the, for the organization. Um, and I won't read it to you. You can take a minute and read it to yourself. Um, but again, this is what the team uh, decided and landed on as part of this process. And again, I'll point out again that the, the, the words that were selected um, from the portrait of a graduate were the words that were highlighted uh, in the gold, gold letters. Yeah, next slide. <clears throat> so the next piece of this was the vision, the vision statement. And again, the purpose uh, of the vision statement as described by the tool was that it was to, to articulate the ideal state that the organization would want to achieve. It's the future of the organization. Where do, they, where do we want to go? Um, so it's not so much the how-to, but it's how do we get, it's, it's where do we go, where do we, where do we want to end up. Um, coupled with that, you know, we have our, our very, you know, important tagline that you hear threaded through everything we do here in Upper Darby School District. Uh, most recently, one of our graduates threaded those opportunity unit excellence through his, his speech last Friday. So we felt like it was a very important um, part of our district to maintain and somehow thread through and make part of our vision statement. Um, so again, we, we kind of narrowed it down to a couple different versions of a vision statement. And this is what the team, we actually had a vote, a virtual vote, uh, in terms of what, what would be our vision. It was, a, it was a close call, I believe, too. It was, I think it was down to one or two votes separated. Uh, two very similar vision statements, only tweaked by a couple, you know, couple words. But this is what the team landed on as our vision statement for this, comprehen this comprehensive plan. 
Again, I won't read it to you. You can read it to yourself. But again, we wanted to make sure we focused on the really key, key parts of our district that already are in place that have been successful and that carry, carry this work, work through. So as Ms. Kelly mentioned, you know, a big, a really large part of the planning process was uncovering the data, tearing apart the state uh, level data, local assessment data by all student groups and disaggregate groups as well. And you'll see in the, in the, in the, the actual plan, there were a number of different strengths and, we, and challenges we've identified to be part of the planning process. But then we had to select certain um, strengths and challenges that were important as, as part of the planning, the tool to a focus on and identify. Now, whereas strengths wouldn't necessarily turn into a goal, um, the strengths were, that were geared towards helping us leverage the work we've done to achieve those or have those areas to become strengths into overcoming our challenges in our district. Um, you can see there were 12 strengths identified. But we focused on um, four that, were, that we made comments on in the plan that we felt were very important. I'm sure, you, as you, we've all heard, the public and the board have heard over a number of uh, different presentations, the growth in this district is a, is a strong point with our student growth, with PVAS and how students go from point A to point B. <clears throat> so we believe that part of the reason why that is a strength of ours is because of the instructional strategies and the interventions and the, pro and the frameworks we have in place to make sure that we are focusing in on providing supports to students to achieve that growth over a period of time. Um, and you'll see as you go through our action steps and our, and our, and our, our, our strategies where you know, the, the, the strengths come into play with overcoming or planning for our, our challenges. Next slide. Another area of strength is our internal mechanisms for processing budgeting uh, resources and how uh, the business office, you know, Mr. Rogers works with other offices in the curriculum instruction um, office or in the student service office to provide appropriate supports uh, in a very fiscally responsible way, but also providing uh, the proper support to our students when the supports are needed. So we felt like that was a, a, a point of pride of our district, that we are very focused on working together to make sure that student achievement is a focus of, of what we do each and every single day. <clears throat> Another point of pride that we wanted to make sure we didn't lose sight of was the industry-based learning indicator with Upper Darby High School. Um, they achieved an 18-19 school year, an 84.2% in, in that indicator, which far exceeded the statewide average um, in, this, in this specific indicator. And again, this speaks to one of the goals which you'll hear about with our graduation uh, rate and graduation pathways, providing students opportunities to achieve or go down their pathway to graduate high school and also meet Act 158 requirements for graduating high school. So we feel like this is an important strength to highlight and then capitalize on in the rest of our plan. So Ms. Kelly's gonna go over some of the challenges on uh, the next couple of slides. So similar to the work um, to identify the strengths, um, the team um, examined the data and analyzed the data to establish um, what challenges we were gonna focus on throughout the, um, this plan. Um, we analyzed the 18-19 um, data and local data because, um, of course, there was no data released for the 2019-2020 school year. So it, as people are looking at why or questioning why we use this data, that is the reason why that was under the guidance of um, PDE also. Um, what we, the plan allowed districts to concentrate on identifying four challenges um, to guide the work. So um, it allows uh, districts to uh, really concentrate on specific areas and not go too broad in how many goals or how many challenges uh, we were going to establish. So the focus, it really narrowed the focus this plan. Um, our first challenge that we identified was um, on the, the student achievement side where in ELA, where we have um, none, no schools meeting or exceeding the statewide average um, in English language arts. Um, remember, when we're talking about student growth, which is PVOTS, it's, it's different than our achievement data, which is indicated by PSSAs. So um, that was our first uh, area, uh, or that was our first challenge that we identified as a team, that n none of our schools were meeting or exceeding the statewide average in ELA. Um, the second challenge that, sorry, the second challenge that we focused on, very similar to the first, was in the area of mathematics. Um, 
Here, the all student group did not meet or exceed the interim target in 12 out of the 13 schools. Um, so we were falling short of the statewide average there also for um, the PSSAs. So again, an area for achievement that we are going to look at and concentrate this plan on is um, in the area of mathematics based on the PSSAs and local assessments. Two other challenges that we focused on were the um, incidents um, for, uh, based on the school safety report. So that was one of the, uh, the other pieces of um, the Future Ready Index that we were able to use um, as a data source. And through that data source, we um, were interested in looking at um, the, the infractions that were happening during the 18-19 school year as well. And then the last piece is the graduation cohort or the four-year graduation cohort um, that is not meeting or um, not meeting the interim goal or the improvement target. Um, so that was our fourth challenge. So again, we were able to look at four challenges and really dig deep into these four challenges and how we are going to support them through the plan. So. Um, no, that's okay. Mr. Marshallack is now going to focus on how do these challenges feed into the goal setting and how do they become part of the work that we have to do for the next three years. Okay, so the real, the real meat of the plan that took after the, the, the data re review and pulling apart the data was developing the goals, developing the action steps and action plans to align with that goal. This is where the plan or the, the, the planning process, you know, varied, you know, greatly from the previous planning process a number of years ago. Um, so the first part is, you know, when we, the, the four identified uh, challenges that Chris, uh, Ms. Kelly just uh, explained, that was the maximum number of challenges we could have select to be priorities in the plan. So we couldn't go beyond the four challenges um, to create additional action plans. They'll have to be relevant and be based upon the four, the four priority challenges. Uh, and the goals were developed based upon the challenges. So each challenge had a, developed a priority statement. And then within the priority statement, you were able to develop one to two uh, measurable, or they call them SMART goals, specific, manageable, or meaningful, excuse me, attainable, relevant, and time sensitive. Um, so no more than two goals per priority statement per challenge. So we had four challenges and no more than two goals per challenge, um, in, in, I guess in simple math. So the first step, and again, then that rolled into the action, the action plans as well, which we'll talk about in, in, in a minute. So the first um, uh, uh, priority statement, and this is where we brought in information and the key parts of our former plan um, into this plan. What you see up there under goal setting is one of the former strategies that was, that was uh, uh, listed or detailed in the former comprehensive planning process, and also is one of Dr. McGarry's goals that he had mentioned in his December or in, in the, one of the previous superintendent reports uh, this, this past uh, winter. And we felt like it was very important because it was something that we felt like it was, it, it, it was an important part of our plan from the past. Our planning teams selected these areas as well to focus on what they wanted to bring over and still continue to focus on on this new plan. So the first one, again, and you have, are familiar with this as well, so I won't read the, the entire uh, uh, priority statement, but again, it talks about reducing barriers and preparing students to become uh, prepared to graduate high school and become college and their career ready and increase student achievement. So this first area is, are the, is the ELA challenge. And the two goals that we developed based on that priority statement was based on the ELA challenge with student achievement would be to in, in, increase professional development with our K-2 population of, of teachers uh, with the aim, our pathway to proficient reading through the AIM Institute um, for our early, our, our youngest readers. We felt that was a very important piece to focus on as a, as a foundational block for our district. Moving down the line, the next area was a student achievement goal, uh, which we believed to improve student achievement in English language arts as a result of state testing. And again, this would have been increasing number of schools that were meeting the interim target over a three-year period, which I forgot to mention, I apologize, that each goal had to have a three-year time frame of implementation. So the goals are broken up over three years, where the, in year three is when you are gonna achieve the goal you set out to, that you set in, 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 at the onset of the, of the planning process. So again, professional development was a key part, getting all as many teachers as we can over the course of three years exposed to and involved in this professional development with our K-2 uh, youngest readers. Additionally, 
to improve student achievement in ELA that will hopefully come as a result of that work and as a result of everything else you'll see later in the planning action steps to improve the number of schools who are hitting that interim target over the course of three years. <clears throat> the next goal or the next uh, priority statement, again, very similar, talked about removing barriers to address student uh, or to improve student achievement and preparing students become uh, prepared to graduate high school and beyond. This area focused on math. So again, as Ms. Kelly talked about with the area of the challenge area with, uh, with math, we again wanted to focus on professional development. Another area was important across our K-12 classrooms with improvement in professional development in the area of math and, and the conceptual understanding of, of how to teach math so that our students can better understand and better process through how to do it. Removing the algorithm, removing all the little tricks and trades to learn how to do math, but really have an understanding of how to teach math and learn math in the classroom. And again, coupled with that is a student achievement goal. We want to make sure that, again, we improve our, air, uh, our students or the number of schools who are meeting that interim target over the course of three years. And you saw from the, the challenge, we had you know, one to, to, to no schools meeting in, the, in, that, in that area. Um, again, important area focused on ELA and math being taken from the Future Ready Index and our state assessments. So looking at graduation rate, which we, we heard as, a, as another relevant or a re related uh, area or challenge area. And again, very similar priority statement, keeping with the, the theme of reducing barriers, prepare students to, uh, to graduate high school. Um, we want to focus on our graduation rate. And in this goal, we want to surpass the statewide average and the statewide goal by year three to get to 95% at the end of year three in our four-year cohort. <clears throat> we also want to have 100% of our schools meeting the career readiness indicator, meaning that all of our students are, over the course of their career in, in Upper Darby, learning and being exposed to careers, college and education workforce standards, and they're uh, maintaining, keeping up with the artifact collection to prove and to learn and demonstrate their learning in that area to prepare them to meet that graduation goal that we have set. So Ms. Kelly's going to go through the action, the action steps in the or action plans in the next couple of slides. And just to kind of give you like a, a preview, which I, you know, what I, I uh, did not mention in the first slide, these are all now based on the goals that we have selected and, and created. The next step in the planning process is identifying evidence-based strategies that are aligned to the ESSA tiers of, ev of evidence-based. We have to select those to start the planning process of the action plans. And Ms. Kelly will go through that in the next couple of slides. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed, yeah, I missed one slide. Sorry, last, last slide, and a pretty important one too. This, this now switches gears a little bit to the other uh, uh, part of the comprehensive plan that we uh, pulled over from the previous planning process. And again, establishing a district system that fully ensures that each member of the district community promotes, enhances, and sustains a shared vision of positive school climate and ensures family and community support of student participation in the learning process. So the two areas here we're going to address, the two challenges, were captured under the, the incidents um, of behavior in, in our schools to reduce those incident behaviors and also for our buildings to all have a leadership team and a team in each building that will be in charge of building capacity in the area of trauma-informed education and also the restorative practices work that we've done and the social emotional learning that will be taking place over the next couple of years. And again, both of these, these goal areas um, were taken from the two challenges that we have, we've identified um, in the previous planning part. So a positive to using the new tool has been that each section feeds the next section. Um, and at the, this is the go part of the plan where we're actually able to get some of the work done that has to, uh, that to reach the goals that we've established. So the goals, like Ed said, are the, or the nicknames for the goals, which we also had to identify, are the, in the gold at the top of each piece. And underneath that, like um, Mr. Marshall X said as well, are the evidence-based strategies to reach each of those goal areas. Um, again, these evidence-based strategies and interventions and act activities are recommended by PDE and suggested by um, on, in ESSA um, as, uh, as outcomes for um, best practices. 
um, you will notice that when you review the full plan that will be available online um, tonight, it's already in board docs, but will also be available on our district website after tonight's presentation. The action steps uh, drive our professional development plan as well. Um, and they consist of the timeline for implementation, and you'll see this all in the plan. You'll see the person that's gonna be responsible or the office responsible, any budget implications when um, putting these pieces into play. Um, and this is all gonna be used as we um, go forward with our own professional development plan for the 21-22 school year and beyond. Um, usually in July and during the committee meeting, we will present the um, the calendar and that calendar has been used to uh, look at this so that they're talking to each other both pieces. Again, you will see evidence-based strategies have been identified to support the goals. Again, the goals in the top um, in gold um, and the strategies are contributing to building the remaining sections of the plan um, to where an outcome or evaluation and monitoring has to take place based on these um, bullet points listed up, um, up at the screen. I would like to highlight an example of um, this and how it builds into the other section. So if you examine the first bullet under the positive school community and climate, um, positive behavioral interventions and support, so PBIS, we're, we know that language already, but this is an action step for us in that, or when you're reviewing the plan, you'll see it listed as an action step, and it, the action step is to refine and continue to establish the PBIS uh, framework in all of our schools. So each of these bullet points would have an action step, at least one that would support the work that we are going to do. And that's how the plan feeds into each other. There was a lot to put on slides, so we kept, we kept the bullets there to remind people of how we were going to reach those goals. But then inside the plan itself, as you're reviewing online, you will see everything spelled out. And then the, the last one, again, I'm not going to read through all of the evidence-based strategies, but as you review the documents, you'll be able to see that these will support the identified challenges that we established in the first few slides of our presentation tonight. One more. Okay. Um, so the action plans, again, um, these would be the steps to reach those um, gold goals but are set for three years, and I think Mr. Marshall Eck did mention this, and the, the district will have to monitor how um, the plan for reaching these goals, which is part of the new tool, but it also allows us um, to make some notes, to make revisions if we have to, but we can't change the action plan. So we can simply, we could put a sentence in there, we can make notes that, you know, in trying to reach this goal, we had to change something that we were doing. So, Although we're, it looks like we're set to using these pieces, um, we can make notes and keep monitoring how we feel the district is um, progressing on this. I'm gonna turn it back over to Mr. Marshallak um, to discuss the other plans that are embedded in um, this new tool and then finish up with the next steps. And just to, you know, as a point of clarity, when we, we mentioned the word ESSA, that's, that's new, you know, not new anymore, but it's the legislation after No Child Left Behind, the Every Student Succeed Act. Um, Pennsylvania has taken a couple of years to catch up with this planning tool to catch up with the ESSA standards. We talked about evidence-based practices. That was a new, you know, a term under ESSA, where before it was research-based um, programs or interventions. There's a heavy emphasis um, in, uh, under ESSA and in this planning tool to identify and use evidence-based strategies. In fact, it was impressed upon us that you have to use them um, and they provide us with a number of resources to go through and search for the levels of tiers of, of evidence, one from being very strong down to four being you know, very, you know, almost non-existent, I suppose. Um, and many of, the, many of the, the strategies we've identified in our plan, we've been doing it in our district for a number of years already and have, have evidence to back the, 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 um, the success of those interventions in similar school districts such, such as ours. Um, but the last you know, piece, and, and you'll see in the, uh, one of the last pieces you'll see in, in the, uh, the documents are the additional state required plans. Um, one you will not see up here, which if you recall, was the special education plan. Historically, that plan was embedded into the comprehensive plan in previous planning tools or planning, uh, planning years. This year is different, it's not embedded into this tool. 
Oh, to remember, recall, we did approve this last spring um, during the pandemic. Um, so that special education plan is in place um, for the next three years. And, we, and it is referenced as a supplementary plan um, in, this, in our planning process. We did talk about it as part of um, looking at, the, at, at our planning process with this. But these are the required plans under, they're going to be submitted to the, department, to, to the board and to the Department of Education um, for approval. The first of which is the academic standards and assessment requirements under Chapter 4. And again, many of these are assurances and making have the district kind of verifying that they have the procedures and policies in place to ensure that these um, aspects of the different PA code chapters are being um, followed in, in our school district. And again, the first one is Chapter 4 to make sure we are following the PA core standards or PA standards. We have a, an appropriate scope and sequence and also an assessment schedule to assess all of our students um, under, under Chapter 4. The next of which is Student Service Assurances, Chapter 12. And this is to provide that we are assuring that we have a comprehensive student service uh, program plan in place in our district that has comes with supports and referral processes and uh, interventions for our students under Chapter 12. One thing you'll notice in this, in this particular plan um, and under one of the assurances was a, uh, um, a checkoff or a, an area that references school resource officers. So we don't employ school resource officers in our school district, and nor do we have a policy that governs how they are, being, they are used. So that area is left blank. Um, it's been verified that that does not mean that we are not in compliance with Chapter 12. It just references that we, just, we don't use them and don't have them. Um, so it, it's, not, it's no harm on the district to, to leave that area blank um, when, when submitting to the, to, to the state. Our policy does talk about stu uh, security uh, guards, not school resource officers, to make that, you know, make that clear. Um, professional development plan, which you'll see threaded through a lot of the action steps, um, do talk about the professional development um, steps that we'll need to put in place to see through all these different aspects of our comprehensive plan. You'll also see them in the professional development plan as a supplementary or a required plan, um, which will also gear or also you know, drive the work we're going to do with the uh, uh, professional development calendar, which you'll, you'll see in July, and then the work we'll do next year to not only support our, our teachers and staff with seeing through these initiatives, but also drive the work of the plan over the next couple of years to make sure we are staying on, on target and implementing the plan as designed over the next couple of years. Next of which is the induction plan. Again, how we're going to assure assurance to how we're going to support our, our, our new teachers, our novice teachers coming in uh, with a, an induction program within the school district, being assigned a mentor, and going through different levels of training that our new teachers need or required to have when they become employees of Upper Darby School District. And again, that's also you know, a relation, uh, relationship of, of another requirement for insurance for our school district. And the last one there, last of not, but not least, is the gifted, gifted education plan. Um, this is, again, another set of assurances that, that make sure that we are following Chapter 16, which is the gifted education uh, law under, under the PA, PA code. And what it describes is our um, program delivery or service delivery models, our screening and identification process, and how we are, how we are programming for students who are gifted um, and require uh, gifted services in our school district. So the next steps, and as you know, Ms. Kelly you know, mentioned, you know, one of the, the features of this uh, uh, planning tool, and we just had a conversation you know, not too long ago with our, our, the lead from the state um, who's been supporting us along the way, <clears throat> is that whenever we want to adjust a part of the plan or we want to reflect on the plan or we want to, or for example, a new initiative comes up that we think is important and we want to incorporate it as part of the plan, there is an area or a section of the comprehensive planning tool that allows teams to go back in and monitor progress over time. So there's a, a, an actual section which each year, or as frequently as you want, we can go back in, get the team together, review the data, how are we meeting our goals, are we maintaining with our, the goals we set forth in our plan, and we can make notable observations in that planning tool that will then carry over to the next planning process. So for example, if we wanted to, to if we, if we start a new initiative, you know, two years from now, we felt was very, very important, we wouldn't go back in and open this plan back up and add it in. We'd make that notable, notable observation in the, in the monitoring component for the next planning process to incorporate that, that initiative, if that makes sense. Um, but this evening, we'll start our 28-day public review um, of the plan, or the plans, I should say. 
We're going to ask the public that they do take a look at the, the documents. Uh, in board docs, we'll have it up on the website. You know, um, if, if not this evening, tomorrow morning. We'll also have posted the comprehensive plan uh, web, uh, email address for anyone who has comments or questions or um, anything of that nature with, with respect to the plans. They can submit their feedback to that, that email address. Um, the goal is to bring this back, if, if any revisions, um, to the July 27th committee meeting. And anything we do adjust or tweak over that time, we'll highlight and, put and, and present a new, you know, the finalized you know, version of the plan on July 20, uh, 27th with the hope that we can have uh, board action at the August uh, board meeting to put the plan in place for the start of the new school year. Um, and that's, that was always the goal, moving, moving along. Um, and I think that's it. Do you have any questions for Ms. Kelly or myself? Thank you, Mr. Marshallack and Ms. Kelly. Ms. Buford, um, are there any comments from the board members online? President Brown would uh, like to ask a question. Oh, sure. President Brown? Uh, Ms. Kelly and Mr. Marshall, like first, thank you for taking us through that and for your work on the comprehensive plan and briefing the new tool. Um, is it safe to say that the portal provides a repository to house and provide structure for the goals? Is that safe? Is that a good yes. summary of yes. Yes. what I saw? Okay. Um, do you feel like the portal was easy to use or was it yet another thing, like another um, initiative that you had to implement? What's the uh, consensus? Um, it was definitely different than years past. Um, once we got into the tool, it was um, easy to use. The technology worked better than it had in years past. So that was, that was very good. Um, we did have to make plenty of phone calls to our friends um, at the, that were leading the comprehensive plan at the state level mm -hmm. um, just to figure out exactly what they were looking for in certain sections, especially um, when we're talking about the evidence or the the action plan where you definitely had to use evidence-based strategies. We weren't positive of how that would work. Um, but once we got into the groove of things, we, we definitely spent many, many hours uh, working on it. Thank you. Uh, I, mean, we're, I think we're, at the end of the day, we're very pleased at the way that it worked for us. And at first it was, and again, we're going back almost a year and a half now, the training we went through, that then had you know, kind of taken a backseat to the pandemic. So, you know, Christy and I kind of learned it on our, on our own, you know, kind of playing around with it, but it was very, it was user friendly and we, and we got to know it pretty well. Okay, my last question, sorry, last question was, um, there's a lot of data that comes out of this. Do you think it'll be easier to analyze the data with the tool? Do you think it'll make it easier to analyze the data? Yes, absolutely. The format of this does make it a lot easier than um, in years past. So um, we're hoping that, you know, they don't make significant changes to the tool once again, but right now it is easy to use, it's easy to analyze, it's easy to go back in and update things or monitor them and put um, uh, comments in, um, which I, do, I think the tool before that was a little bit more cumbersome. Thank you very much. No. I'll give a lot of credit to our, our teams too, that they really pulled out the data and went right down to the very nitty gritty of, of the data. Um, our map data, our Dibbles data, um, you know, down to the disaggregate groups, I mean, they really pulled apart and really went in very, very good detail, um, the points of pride and the challenges that we have um, in, in our data. So they, they did an awesome job with that. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Brown. I believe Mr. War Savage is next. Thank you, Mrs. Mitchell. Um, my, I just really have a pretty much a comment. Um, I just want to thank the administration uh, and the teams responsible for the culmination of this project. Um, this was actually one of the things that I was really super excited uh, seeing come to fruition ultimately when I was first elected to the board uh, a year and a half ago. It seems like forever ago uh, at this point because we've all been through so much together and have come through and persevered. And I also want to point out um, to the public uh, just how forthright and transparent this team is because a lot of the data that they did present in that presentation can be extrapolated or pulled from a lot of different public resources, but because they were so forthright, honest, and transparent about the challenges that do exist and the opportunities they're in to do a whole lot better, that just goes to show you how much this team loves all of your kids and how committed we are to really knocking it out of the park with this comprehensive plan. So again, thank you team for all of your hard work. Thank you, Mr. Warsavage. Dr. McGarry? 
I just two things I wanted to comment, follow up to, to Board President Brown's comment. I think the tool, the data that's in the tool comes from, as Mr. Warsavage said, pulling it from other resources. One of the cumbersome elements will this this will still be. You still have to go to those data elements to track your progress toward the plan. That the plan will not automatically pull from all the data sources. So we're still going to have to go and do that work on our own it, um, to analyze the, those goals. I think that's an important piece. Um, and I want to say to Christine and to Ed, um, from my office, having done this job in a former life, uh, the one putting this plan together in a previous life, I'm happy to hear the tool improve because it was an awful, god-awful tool in the past. And I want to say to the two of you, I know that with everything else that's going on in the school community over the last year, the fact that you were able to lead this charge, and I have witnessed firsthand the hours upon hours of time that you put into the two of you, trying to get other people to get, get their homework done, lead this, get people to attend meetings, getting the public to engage in some of those committees is, is always a challenging part of trying to lead a comprehensive plan. And you'll find that other people will come out later and say, well, what was going on? I know it was, it was a challenge and your effort and your work and your hours and your commitment to the school district with your day-to-day -day lives and the jobs that you already have on top of a charter school defense on top of everything else, I just want to say from my office to you, thank you so much for your leadership and your hard work. Thank you, Dr. McGarry. I was going to echo that as I wrapped this up. Um, being part of the process, um, this is the third comprehensive planning that I've participated in. And um, I thought that this time um, was very, very well organized. No offense, Dr. McGarry. Um, and the, um, the, community per the community participation um, was um, commendable as well. So I just wanted to thank those community members and, and teachers who, and administrators who did participate and give up lots and lots of hours um, attending those meetings that we held on Thursday afternoons. Um, so thank you very much. Are there any other comments or questions from board members at this time? All right, seeing none, Dr. McGarry, if you could just review how the public would participate in this particular part of the committee meeting, if they had any questions maybe or we'll comments. Just maybe we'll just have Ed and Christine do it, since they're so, <laughs> they're, they're perfect, I'm only kidding. Um, yes, members of the public, if you can phone in at 610-789-7200 and extension 2000. Again, if you just leave your name and address and the report or agenda item you'd like to comment on this evening. Uh, the administration and the board will certainly do our best to answer those questions. Or you can email at committee questions, uh, committee meeting questions at upperdarbysd.org. And again, please leave your name, address, and the uh, specific agenda item you'd like to question or comment on, and we'll do our best to, to supply a reasonable answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McGarry. In this next section, we're going to go over policies, and there's just one policy on our agenda, which is policy 246. And I'm going to turn that over to Mr. Desnoyers. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Uh, so as uh, Ms. Mitchell indicated, uh, there is only one policy uh, with, <coughs> changes for, um, with changes under consideration at this meeting. That policy is policy 246, school wellness. And the, uh, there's only one change in that policy. And this change um, came as a request from the administration that due to the uh, changes to the high school schedule uh, that came about as part of the high school schedule uh, scheduling project, um, the administration is requesting that the minimum time for lunch be reduced to 10 minutes. Um, so this is, um, this is accommodated in the new high school schedule as presented um, uh, in previous meetings. Um, and I would like to remind um, uh, those participating in this meeting and the pub uh, public and parents and so forth more broadly um, that uh, a minimum time for lunch does not mean that uh, that is the time that will be implemented um, uh, this policy allows for uh, longer lunch periods to be implemented 
um, as administration sees fit. So um, with board approval tonight, this will be voted on at the July board meeting and go into effect. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions on this agenda item for school wellness, the change in the school wellness policy? I don't see any. Um, Ms. Buford, do we have any comments or questions from board members? We do not. Okay. Um, at this time, we can just review the agenda items. Oh, no. First, we have to take our public comment. Do we have any public comments tonight on our um, agenda items or questions, Ms. Buford? We do not have any comments this evening. Okay. So at this time, we will um, review the agenda items, Ms. Kelly. Uh, the first item was the PSBA um, legislative platform, with, which was informational. Um, the second item was the Upper Darby School District comprehensive plan, um, which was also informational. And then the third item was the policy, um, which was 246 school wellness, which will need to move forward for um, July board vote. Okay, so I think we all agreed that three, um, the three board members who are willing to participate on the PSBA platform committee, everyone's comfortable with um, them being a presentation on July 13th or a short presentation potentially to vote on on July 13th. Yes. 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 Okay, great. And then uh, agenda item number two, the comprehensive plan is information. I'll be posted for 28 days on the district website. Will there be communication going out to the public about that um, posting? We, we can do that. Yep. All right. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so that was just informational. And policy, policy 246, are we ready to move that forward to the board meeting for a vote? Yes. 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 Okay, great. Well, our next meeting is on July 27th of the Education and Pupil Services, and I'm going to turn this back over to President Brown to adjourn the meeting. A motion is in order for the adjournment of the Education and Pupil Services Committee meeting. So moved. All in favor? Uh, Aye. 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 All right, meeting adjourned. We will take five before we start the finance and operations. Thank you.
Welcome back. Uh, we will now have the Finance and Operations Committee virtual meeting. Uh, all board members are still present from the Education and Pupil Services meeting. The meeting will come to order. I will now turn over the Finance and Operations Committee meeting to my co-chair, Mr. Fields. Thank you, Board President Brown. Uh, uh, Craig Rogers, uh, please, um, I will turn over the uh, finance, I'm sorry, Mr. Rogers, please begin with an overview of your agenda items for this evening. Sure, so tonight we have f four agenda items, one of which has been postponed until the July Finance and Op Operations Committee meeting. Uh, first up will be the Eastern Delco Bicycle Prioritization Study, which is informational. We'll have Mr. David Schwartz from Bergman uh, architects, engineers, and planners provide an update on the Eastern Delaware County Bicycle Prioritization Study. Number two is the 2021-2022 final budget presentation, which is board action. I'll provide a presentation on the updated budget in accordance with the Act 1 timeline, and we'll ask for the board to move this forward for adoption later tonight. Uh, number three was going to be a board policy uh, conversation around public meetings. Uh, as I previously stated, this agenda item has been postponed to the July FNO uh, committee meeting. The fourth item is regarding policies that went through for first reading in the, uh, earlier this month, and we have three policies tonight, uh, 800.1 electronic signatures and records, 816 district social media, and 916 volunteer. So if you don't mind, we'll jump right into the first agenda item. So at this time, I'm going to hand it over to Mr. David Schwartz. Thank you very much, Mr. Rogers. And I want to give a special thanks to School Director Fields, Marvin Lee, and Forrest Tarver for setting this up. And thank you to all of you for allowing me to come in this evening. This is a quick note, in addition to my day job at Bergman, I also am a school board member for, 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 for Township, for the school district up there. And I know how much everybody loves staring at PowerPoints all night. So I'll try to be quick through this. Um, Mr. Fields and Mr. Tarver are both on the steering committee for this project, so if you have any questions, please forward it to them. They can forward it to me, and I'll be happy to address any questions that, that you may have. So let's look at the background quickly. Um, this study is a study that's being funded through the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission, DVRPC. It was a grant that was given to borough, uh, the, the borough of Lansdowne. They partnered with East Lansdowne, Upper Darby, and, 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 and Yaden for this study. The purpose of this study um, is, as many of you may know, in Philadelphia, they have a very, very well-connected, well-managed bicycle network. In East Delaware County, to be kind, we do not. So we are looking to find some ways to, to, to create more, more bike routes, uh, more, bi more bicycle improvements, and one of those is to outreach to the public. And we, we want to do that through the school district, through, through, through you all, to parents and to students. See at the bottom of, uh, of the screen here, some links and QR codes. We, we, we have two surveys that we've set up, one for parents, one, one for students. We would ask that this be included in, one, in some email blasts that you send out to parents, because our first step of this is, to, is really to get some input from the public on this study. Where you want, this is a very, very utilitarian study. This is not a visionary study looking at why bike road, you know, why bike lanes are good, why, you know, the benefits of, of, of cycling, healthy environment, yada, yada. This is basically accepting that all the municipalities in the area are more or less on board with getting bicycle facilities installed. So this is very, you know, very much a where and what. So we're trying to get this out and um, appreciate your help on that. So, so I'll go over just some of the goals of, 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 of the study, some of what we're trying to do. The first step is to click public input. And that's, the, that's a big step because public input is going to be, is going to really drive a lot of the improvements that we look at, a lot of the ideas for the study. Um, a lot of destinations, we're going to ask people where, where they're going, what routes they feel comfortable using, what would make routes more comfortable for them, what, what do we need to make a bicycle network safe and efficient. By the way, don't be thrown by the map here. The map is not going to include all, all of Upper Darby, because you may know Upper Darby is big. So if you were to show it all, <laughs> you would not be able to see anything else. So don't be offended by the extents of, uh, of the maps here. We only have a little bit, uh, bit of real estate on the uh, slides. So we are then going to evaluate some of the routes and look over improvements. If any of you know, um, if you have been to Center City or, or anywhere else that uh, has a lot of bike lanes, you, you've probably seen, or, or bike routes, you've probably seen bike lanes, conventional ones. There also are things called cycle tracks, uh, bike boxes, which allow bikes to get in front of people at intersections, bike signals. A lot of these things are becoming more and more standard. And these are things that we want to look at 
as we go, you know, as, as we continue these routes into Delaware County and introduce these to, to, to a new population, and especially to a younger population of students at, at the schools. We want to get people um, into biking early on. So that's why we thought school districts would be a great way to, um, to, to do that. So let's look through the here a little bit. This, this part I'll uh, blow through a bit faster. Um, public input obviously will be the most important part. We'll, we also go through a series of analytics. We'll look at studies that have been done. This, for example, is something that was done by, by Delaware County for a, for, for a trail network. This is something that was uh, put together. You see some of the lines on here. Um, some, something called the circuit, which is a DVRPC-led effort. They're looking to put trails and bike routes throughout uh, the, the, the region. There's some local efforts, the light green on there, something that Lansdowne is doing, the borough of Lansdowne, they're putting in bike loop. But, 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 but we're gonna look at all these and try to find out where the missing links are. What's been planned, what's been, you know, what's out there, and maybe how could we help to complete some of these links through this study. We also will look at some analytics like bicycle densities, you know, where is biking uh, mo more common, something called Strava data, which measures, you know, volumes of, uh, of a cyclist th through various areas. DVIPC has a bunch of good um, tools to use. They have uh, uh, priority routes, connectivity analysis. I'm not going to belabor this. Um, here's some traffic volumes, some of the um, higher volume roads. Higher volume roads do not preclude bikes. They just need to have, oh, they just need to have some very um, higher impact improvements when we look to make cycling safer. And this one is very hard to see, so I won't go over this too much. This is another thing that DVRPC has presented. One thing I do want to point out, um, one thing that they, have, that they have done is they have looked at roads through the area and determined levels of vehicle stress, or LTS. And really what that does is it indicates how stressful certain roads are to bike on. Now, fortunately in our area, we're an older area, an urban area with, with a grid system of roads. So you'll see on this, on this map here probably a lot of a lot of dark green lines. Those indicate very, very easy to bike, to bike areas. Now, unfortunately, they don't all connect to, to, to one another. Um, you have some of uh, the higher stress roads here. So, what, uh, so one of our jobs is, is, is to look at some of these connections and figure out, okay, if we want to connect all of these roads, what can we do to make them safer? It's really going to be about suitability. And then finally, we'll get into recommendations. Um, some of them will be, uh, our higher priority ones will be very detailed. Some of our longer range ones might be a bit less detailed, but one thing we really are gonna focus on is getting improvements that are implementable in the, in the short term. And on that note, actually, I do have a little update on, on, on this project. Normally, we, will, we, we would wait until after a project's done before you put forth recommendations and have them accomplished. This case is, is a bit of a, we, we had an opportunity, basically. Uh, PennDOT is repaving Lansdowne Road in 20, they were supposed to do it last year in 2020. COVID put that off. They're gonna re, they're, it's going to be repaved from Garrett Road all the way down to the city of Philadelphia. Now, they had done some coordination previously with, with Lansdowne and Yaden to get some bike lanes, to get some shared use arrows in the roadway installed. At the time when they started doing this, Upper Darby, Township administration was somewhat lukewarm about bike lanes. Um, that the, 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 they have since had a shift in administration, a shift in 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 policy, and they they found out about this project and said, "Could we put in bike lanes as part of this project?" Lansdowne got involved. We got we we brought in, into the loop, and essentially we were able to coordinate with PennDOT to have them push this project off by another month or two. So we'd be done at the end of summer, and include bike lanes as part of their design. So you see on here the, uh, the, the small green line that um, was there, that, the, 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 those were some planned um, bike, uh, uh, bicycle facilities that, that were gonna be done as part of this project. And the big yellow line there is something that will now be done as part of this new study. So we got a recommendation done before we even made recommendations, which is always a good thing. So um, that's something that, that you will see later on this year. And those are the kind of things that, that we're gonna look for throughout the course of, of, of this effort. So I'll go over the next steps here very, very briefly, and then I'll close. Um, over the summer, we're gonna compile survey data, existing, all of our existing data, do, do our analytical analysis. We're going to develop some, uh, some bike options. We're then gonna have another big public meeting in the fall of this year, and I'll probably come back and give her, or, or, or ask Mr. Field or, 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 
or somebody else to advertise this. We're going to try to get a big, a big turnout at that meeting, in-person meeting, hopefully. Fingers crossed, knock wood. Um, but yeah, so, so, so that's going to present some of our preliminary options. We'll get public feedback from that, and then we'll refine them, get our draft report done, and, and submit everything. Also, one quick note, one thing we're going to try to do is a pop-up event at some point this fall. Now, DVRPC has the user called Expos. They did one recently in Westchester. They, they did one in Narberth, where basically you go out there with temporary facility, you know, with temporary pavement markings. It, it, it's like this tape. You put up uh, barriers or barrels and mimic essentially what a bike lane or what a bicycle track or, or a cycle track or, or what some of these improvements would look like. And it gives people a, a, a chance to test them and to see if they like these. And, you know, it's a lot easier testing once they're actually on the ground. So we're going to look into that in the future. I'm not sure if that's going to work or not, but we, we certainly would, would seek to, to do that. But the purposes of this meeting, I guess, what, what, it, what I'm really looking for is to get this information out to, to folks, have them participate, get some good feedback, and move on. So this is just a quick informational update to, to all of you folks, a request to you know, put out some of this information to parents and, and uh, students. And then more to come, hopefully this fall. Thanks, David. Um, uh, the one thing to keep in mind with the, uh, I think a lot of people around here where they think bike lanes, they think painted line, like one painted line. And that's just, that's just one option. Uh, and from the one meeting we had Penn, with the PennDOT representative that was there, they were very open to much more, much more secure, much safer bike lanes with the reflective lines. And, and that's not the limit. I, I don't know if we could do it here, but I know in some places uh, they just put down a new curb. They said, hey, this, this is for bikes, right? And it's a concrete curb that it, you'd have to make a real effort to go, over, to go into that bike lane in a car. So there's, there's lots of options here in the one, in the one picture. Um, in, in the presentation, you can see like the bike lane is painted a different, the entire lane is painted a different color. Yep. And, um, right there. yeah, <laughs> don't think of it like, as just like a, just a piece of paint that's separating traffic from people on bikes, uh, during the pandemic. Uh, so, um, so every day my wife works, I, I drop her off downtown at Hub, and, uh, uh, more than people walking and more than cars, I see people on bikes. Uh, biking to work and stuff like that, and it's just, it's a, it's, it's, it's a really good option, but it's also something that people are really considering. Um, I think it's, I think it's really important that people from all of Upper Darby's neighborhoods uh, participate in these surveys and and, and, and complete these surveys. Uh, this is an opportunity for input, and, it, and it's it's input you're giving to this coalition, but to the state as well, because PennDOT's going to be looking at this. Um, and it's one of those kind of rare things where you can really say, please keep in mind what Mr. Schwartz said. This is not, the survey is not to argue whether or not bike lanes are good or bad. That's already been decided they're good, right? It's, 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 it's input on where they're going to be. Um, uh, one of the things, one of the concerns that I've heard in talking about this is that uh, traffic, traffic in this community, even on the side roads, tends to move very fast. And, and bike lanes have a way of calming traffic, of, of slowing traffic down, right? Um, people are, they're, you know, a nice wide open road, no lights, no cars, no parked cars. People are inclined to go a little bit faster. But if there's a lot, if there's a lane, if there's reflectors, if there's people on bikes, they're, they're hopefully most drivers are inclined to go a little bit slower. Um, so this, this can have the added effect of, of slowing down traffic. And, and I want the people in the community to think of the, the following initiatives. Um, we, we, we've approved a, a safe walking route study. Um, we're, uh, the community itself, the greater community itself is, is putting in bike lanes. And then we have a schedule change for the high school. And all these are being done independently of each other, but they have the net result of easing traffic conditions in our community, um, extending the life of our roads, because you have fewer cars on the roads, uh, and encouraging healthier habits in our community. Uh, and hopefully, and this is kind of maybe pie in the sky, but improving the overall health of the community. So think about that, and think about that 
when you're doing the study. I'm excited to see um, what roads and what concerns, um, not concerns so much, but what roads people are thinking of for a bike lane on the 19082 side of Lansdowne Avenue. I guarantee on the 19026 side of Lansdowne Avenue, there's going to be like three or four roads that people come up with, right? Bond, School Lane, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe Garrett, maybe State for bike lanes. But I'm really excited to see what's proposed in the rest of the communities in the township. And so that's all I want to say about this. Dave, I really appreciate you coming in. And I hope other people have questions or thoughts or something like that. Just to point out also, you mentioned the Safe Routes to, to School study. We, we are coordinating with that firm who's doing that study as well. So we're not, so they are independent of, of one another, but we're not ignorant, if you will, of uh, other studies that are going on. So we're going to try to make everything kind of sink at the end of this, or throughout the, throughout the course of it, I should say. I, I had a comment, and I really just mostly wanted to echo Don's enthusiasm and say, and say thank you, and um, we are definitely a, a bicycling family, and, <laughs> and I'm really excited about this. My, my wife will be excited about this. My kids will be excited about this, um, and, and I, yeah, it's Don, Don and I like to dream big about how we're going to make everyone walk and bike to school, <laughs> and uh, we're going to keep dreaming, but, but I'm glad that we're, we're at least doing some things to, to move in that direction, so I really appreciate it. We can make a reality. <laughs> We've already got Craig researching the bike rack budget. Right, the, uh, <laughs> the master high-end bike rack budget. Is what we're any, any comments from the board? Any, any comments from the public? Any comments? Board President Brown, Don Fields, I just want to thank you, uh, Mr. Schwartz, for coming here and, and being a part of this. I think the school district's making every effort to improve um, access to our schools. Uh, this will probably promote better curbing in our communities, better support for our kids and healthier kids and healthier schools, I think is always a positive. I think one of the other parts to this, not just the improving of the, of the roads and having roads last longer, healthier kids, mental health supports and services, I think there's also the potential for much uh, savings down the line and, and how mental health and staying active and being healthier, healthier can save um, school districts and help kids and families as well. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schwartz, for your presentation and, and uh, Mr. Fields for your support of this. Um, I will also say that um, uh, my wife and I are a um, biking and walking couple, and um, uh, we have a tendency to um, leave the immediate uh, local area when we, you know, are are desiring to um, uh, bike or walk, and that you know, developing an infrastructure would we would really appreciate it locally. Thank you. Um, are there any comments from the public? We'll do that now. Okay. There are no comments from the public. Okay. You keep throwing at me, but I'm not sure what you want me to do. I mean, you can move on. Like, we wanted to take comments from the public so he wouldn't have to wait to the end of the right. meeting. So right. you, okay. can, you can move on to the next agenda item if there are no, no more questions from the board or the public. Okay, thanks. All right, yeah, if there's, thanks a lot. Craig, right. you can thanks go to the next one. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, David. So now we'll move into the 2021-2022 final budget presentation. So as is with all of our budget presentations so far this year, we'll go through the same process, review what we've done thus far and what our next steps are. So previous to tonight, we've on November 24th, 2020, we presented the option of a preliminary budget versus an accelerated opt-out with a base index of 2.6 or an adjusted index of 3.8. On December 1st, the board approved the resolution not to exceed 3.8% of a tax increase for the 21-22 fiscal year. On May 11th, the board approved the 2021-2022 proposed final budget, and on that same day, we made the PDE 2028 uh, proposed final budget form available to, for public inspection. On June 2nd, we advertised a notice of the intent to adopt the final budget tonight. 
which obviously brings us to June 15th, which is tonight, where I'm providing a, a presentation for the uh, updated final budget, and we'll ask the board to vote on the final budget immediately following the Finance and Operations Committee meeting. And I'll just note, as we always do, that Act 1 requires the board to adopt a budget no later than June 30th of 2021 in this given year. So again, we'll revisit historically uh, a look back at the tax increases historically for Upper Darby from 2016-17 uh, through the current school year. Uh, and you'll see the difference between the actual index in yellow, the base index in the middle, and then the adjusted index in that given year. So for this upcoming budget 21-22, our base index is 2.6 and the adjusted index is 3.8. And we've kept our proposed uh, budget and final budget tax increase at the same amount at 2.6 is the proposed uh, tax increase that is built into the budget you're going to see tonight. Uh, and this is a projection of the actual impact uh, highlighted in gold there uh, towards the bottom of the dollar amount increase for the annual increase to taxes based on the assessment of a, a home or property within the district. So for, for tonight, here are the budget assumptions that have been built into the budget. As I previously stated, we're going out with a 2.6% tax increase, which is right at the base index. Uh, and that base index is actually the 2020-2021 base index versus the 21-22 due to the countywide reassessment. Uh, so the base index is actually lower for Delaware County versus the uh, rest of the state uh, in this given year due to the reassessment. Uh, we built the budget based on level funding for 21-22, meaning we kept the same basic ed and special ed funding uh, across the board. The governor did propose rather large increases uh, for Upper Darby School District and the entire state uh, that would have brought in $25.9 million in additional basic ed funding and $2.3 million in additional special ed funding. Uh, we do not believe that the proposed state budget is going to go through as the way it was proposed. Uh, so in a conservative method, we've left our uh, basic ed and special ed funding at a level funding. Uh, we are not taking into consideration any kind of potential change to the charter school uh, tuition law. We have continued to include the Upper Darby School District asynchronous cyber program with, at $1.3 million. And we have built in the cost of a new bond to continue funding our capital projects program. Uh, and the one big change from this slide to previous slides is that this actually does include ESSER funding of $9.1 million. So we, we'll get into how that impacted the change to the budget. Uh, but we, as we move through the budget process and started finalizing uh, plans for ESSER II funding uh, and specific items that would be purchased and programs that were going to be run in the 21-22 school year, we thought it'd be prudent to, at a minimum, include this 9.1 million um, of the funding. So this slide here is going to give a side-by-side -side comparison of the budget that was approved by the board on May 11th as the proposed final budget and tonight's final budget and the differences. So, you're going to quickly see from the revenue perspective, it jumps from $209 million to $218 million. And as I said on the previous slide, we had included roughly $1.9 million in ESSER funding. Uh, when you include that funding, it's a matching principle. So what happens is you include the revenue and the expenditure, which results in a net impact or neutral impact to your bottom line, or in this case, the way we bounce the budget this year, the use of fund bounce. Um, so as you move down, you see... The expenditures also went up from 200, almost 219 million to 200 and almost 28 million. Uh, so you can see that jump. Uh, prior, before the tax increase, you see the expenditures exceeding re the revenues went from 9.5 million to 9.1. Uh, it's slightly improved over the uh, process of the proposed budget versus the final budget. Uh, as I said, still pr uh, proposing a 2.6% tax increase. Uh, what you'll see here is a slight difference in the dollar amount uh, that 2.6 produces in revenue. So 
on the five uh, on the May 11th proposed side, you'll see 2.736 million versus 2.734. So roughly 2,000, a little less than $2,000 uh, of a difference. Now, you would think that the, there really shouldn't have been a big difference uh, when we talk about calculating a tax increase. Uh, but in my previous presentation, uh, the, the proposed final budget, I did mention that what I planned to do was pull a county file or ask for additional information from our certified tax roll that came out uh, at the beginning of the calendar year opposed to now because there were many, many changes from the at the county level uh, where there may have been errors, uh, you know, appeals, different changes. So what we tried to do was get a mo the most up-to-date file because there's really, you know, this is one chance to reset the millage rate when you go through a reassessment year. And we wanted to make sure we had the most accurate information. In the first go around, we did a, an extensive dive into all of the properties and compared them to uh, what their assessments were previously and then coming up for the reassessment. And you're talking about in excess of 29,000 properties. Uh, so we dove very deep into the details. Uh, we did identify some issues that were communicated back to the county. So between the proposed budget and this final budget, we were able to get a new document and go through that same process of, of funneling out all the details. Um, we also made slight changes to the percentage uh, allocation of, of what we project to receive in revenue. So although it looks like a $2,000 dip, uh, it actually was a, a higher amount. It was closer to about $75,000 due to the change uh, in the millage rate. So what we did was I, I dug in deeper into the collection rates. When you budget tax revenue, you do not take the full millage and multiply it by the full taxable assessment because certain property owners are going to pay, pay a discount, some at face, some at penalty. So on the discount side, it's less than, it's 98% of what would be budgeted at the full millage rate, flats even, and then the penalties at 110%, 10% penalty on top of the uh, tax amount. So you have to take into consideration historical collection, uh, and we work out typically in a given year around 93 to 94% collection when you look at the dollar amount versus 100% of taxes and the actual cash collected. Uh, not to say that we, don't, we only collect 93% of taxes, it's just the dollar amount and how the amount's budgeted. If you were to allocate 100%, you would come in under budget every single year uh, as actual revenue collected versus the, the budgeted amount. Um, so I just wanted to explain the slight difference there. At the end of the day, the use of fund bounce in, in order to bounce the budget is you know, right around 300 and some thousand dollars of a difference, 6.817 versus 6.44. So the final budget ended up netting out to be slightly better than uh, the proposed final budget from May 11th. So what are the differences? And I've kind of touched on a few of them. A neutral impact, and when I say neutral, again, it was a increase to expenditures, it was also an increase to uh, the revenues. You had ESSER two funding the 9.16, uh, we did get title allocations in late um, between the two uh, budgets, so it was an additional $1 million. And then we also reduced the lease purchase uh, budgeted amount by $1.53 million. Uh, lease purchase is a program that we've run through the district for many years. It's usually about just under $2.3 million. It's used to purchase buses and also technology. Part of the $9.1 million is obviously going to be technology to continue moving us through our five-year technology plan. Uh, which has been accelerated dramatically due to ESSER funding. Uh, so I didn't see it prudent to, in the, in the proposed budget, we purposely left it in there as kind of a placeholder for what we would decide to do with the ESSER funding. Uh, so as we move that $9 million in, it was prudent to reduce the uh, lease purchase amount knowing that we were not going to utilize it in the, in the next year. Uh, so then on our revenue side, we had two, two increases that came through. Uh, on tax revenue, about $470,000. That was m mostly uh, to do with transfer and delinquent taxes. Again, uh, you know, when you move through from May to now June, we have a little bit more information on the current year collections, and the proposed budget included a very, very conservative number on um, real estate transfer tax and also delinquencies. So I, I dove back into... Uh, our collections for the given year, ran uh, different trend analysis to see where we may land, 
uh, and that netted us out uh, about $470,000 in additional revenue. Uh, I also increased our food service transfer. Uh, we've always charged overhead from the general fund to the food service program. Uh, in the proposed budget, we came in a little bit lower because the food service program, it, you know, depending on how it runs, could potentially produce more revenue or cost the district more to run the program. As we dug through and looked through the, uh, the plans for next year, uh, I'm predicting that it'll, it'll be closer to a normal uh, overhead charge versus what we've been experiencing in, in the current year. Uh, finally, the expenditure impact, there's an additional, there was an increase uh, to professional services and supplies of about $295,000. Um, again, as we move through the process, you receive more information, uh, go through what could be a quote or a proposal to a final quote uh, and, and work those different pieces into the budget, um, which are, are very minimal impacts. But at the end of the day, uh, it netted out that the budget came out around $300,000 to the better for the district. Um, so again, we'll go back. And tonight we're asking the board uh, immediately following this meeting to vote on the finance and operations or after the finance and operations uh, meeting to vote on this budget, which is included in the finance and budget report. Uh, and again, the, the f latest that the board could adopt a budget would be June 30th. And at this time, if the board has any questions, I can field them. Director Mitchell has a question. Thank you. I, it's not really a question. It's just more of a comment of how frustrating it is every year um, that boards across the Commonwealth are forced to um, raise taxes on their residents, um, basically because the state legislature refuses to fund public education properly, and that they um, often have late um, budgets that are not on time, and, and they don't give us the needed information from the state um, in order to make an educated decision about um, the revenue that that, that isn't, would be included in our budget. So especially this year, with so many unknowns, um, this is a very difficult budget year. Thank you for your hard work. And um, I'm sorry that we have to raise taxes, but we do have to provide for the needs of children. So, and I, pre I appreciate those comments, and thank you. Um, I will say from the state's perspective, it, it's, it's tough. You start seeing, uh, you know, the updates that come out that really don't have any real information in them. They're anywhere from trying to propose a two-year budget to hopefully we get a one-year budget. Uh, no idea, you know, the governor's proposal had, you know, almost $30 million in additional revenue for uh, state funding for our district, um, you know, and that was received as debt on arrival. Um, it, it's definitely tough. I will say from, to try and put a positive spin on it, at least we're not in the situation we were last year where we were told at this same time, worst case scenario was they could go to the three-year average of your state funding, which would have been a decrease going into the 2020-2021 school year. So, you know, we were able to go level funding. Now, it's tough. If they go level funding again for next year, that's two years in a row. Uh, and, you know, I've presented before the impact of a 0% tax increase. It's a very similar model. Uh, you know, I just don't see how you make up for that year after year of flat funding. You know, it's always a lost, a lost revenue stream that typically would be compounding each year. Um, there are definitely pieces of legislation out there that look like they could be promising for a district like ours. Um, you know, if and when they ever go through, then we will obviously plan accordingly and, and react to those, that information. But you're absolutely right. The timing of this is, is always tough. It always has been. Um, and we do our best to make sure that we can get our, our tax bills out as well and get a budget approved within the Act 1 timeline. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rogers, for your excellent presentation. Oh, this is... Uh, President Brown has a comment. Mr. Desnoyers. Um, oh, I apologize. <laughs> I apologize, Director Desnoyers. Desnoyers. Yes. Um, so, and this may may fall under that those um, you know additional proposed legislation um, you've seen or heard about that may at some point in the future be enacted. But I've I've heard some noise about um, a possible state surplus and and using those funds towards um, public education, and I'm wondering if that 
falls under that, you know, potential future possibility. Thank you. I, I can't speak to the, the great details of, of that comment, but absolutely. If, I mean, if that were to be the case, you would hope that they would use it on education funding. I do think the governor came out with a pretty aggressive proposal um, and showed his support for education. Uh, quite frankly, when I read through the updates that are provided from PASBO and uh, PSA, like they are all over the place. I'll read, you'll read a two page document and by the end of it, you know, it may be contradicting itself where you really think, I don't know that I just really received any information because quite frankly, I don't think they, they know enough at this point. I do know that they were supposed to be in session three days this week. They were hoping for a fourth day. Uh, it was the same thing last week. Um, I'm just hopeful that information comes out. Unfortunately, if it comes out tomorrow, it's not a major impact. We're going through the process of our budget now. That's, I think, to Ms. Mitchell's point, they typically will get to almost June 30th to pass their budget or in some years past uh, June 30th, which is, puts school districts in a very tough position. Thank you. I can go? Okay. Yes, President Brown. <laughs> um, I can't really, oh, there he is. He's hiding behind the column. Um, I was. I had a question, but I looked at the charts, and I actually, I think I answered my own question. But I did want to say uh, thank you for your your work on it, because I think you have an unenviable task of trying to keep us informed and, and get all the information and give us as much time as possible to make um, you know a sound decision. This is a sensitive topic. This is taxes. This is the tax increase. So the public is always keenly aware um, and sensitive to. Um, you know, a tax increase, it's money, you know, and we all are, are, we all have to pay it as well. So we try to do our due diligence and be good stewards of the resources. So thank you for um, how much information you give us, how you pay attention to all of the changes that take place throughout this process. Um, so thank you for that. That's it. Thank you. And the, and the one thing I will add is, and it's to the board's credit, you know, stayed firm in, you know, how we increase taxes. There's a lot of conversation around it. Um, 2.6 is at the base index. The board could have went out up to 3.8%, uh, even with the opt-out resolution. Uh, in our previous presentations, we've gone through the trends of starting in 2016, or prior to 2016-17, we had about $2.5 million of use of fund bounce to bounce our budget. And it, we had a 0% tax increase one year in 16-17, which jumped that use of fund bounce. We've been trickling away at how much fund bounce we're using to bounce the budget. This year, we actually went up mm -hmm. from the prior year to bounce the idea of a tax increase while we're still coming out of a pandemic, still in a pandemic. Um, I'm comfortable with where we're at and what, the board, what we're proposing here because I do believe that we have, we have safeguards built into the budget. Uh, we have the ability of, you know, we have a lot of funds coming in through ESSERS uh, and Hopefully, the state budget does pass and there's some type of increase above and beyond the flat funding, which will immediately, you know, pro hopefully put us back in line with that trend. So we're at, you know, just over the six, $6.4 million use of fund bounce and any increase to state funding from now until the start of the year would just bring that amount down once we go through our actual, we start going through the school year and, and see what we realize versus what we budgeted. So Mr. I do commend the, the board for all their hard work. Mr. Rogers, I just want you, since you mentioned the fund balance, I just want you to add one thing, if you could, so that the public is aware. Because uh, some, some uh, members of the public may say, well, why don't we just use all the fund balance to balance our budget and not increase our taxes? But there's, a, there's an effect, a negative effect, uh, using the fund balance based on our bond rating and things like that when we have to go out and fund projects. So if you can just speak to that a little bit, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Sure, and that's, we could spend... A a whole night uh, Please don't. <laughs> on that topic. Please don't. But, qu but quickly, you mentioned the bond rating because that is a hot topic. It comes up all the time, uh, especially when the district's been going out and issuing bonds uh, year over year to fund the capital projects. Uh, bond rating agencies do look at how you budget, use of fund bounds, what are your actual financials when you come out, what's the board's appetite for increasing taxes. So, you know, if you were a school board that went out with 0% taxes all the time and were, or say, two, three years in a row, um, and you use fund balance to balance your budget and financially that that's the reality. Um, there's a potential that your rating goes down and most likely your rating goes down because of, of how you're managing your funds. I, the most simplistic way to look at a fund balance is personal finance. You have a savings account. 
you have a fixed budget, and you so you have your income and your expenses. You know, if your income is less than your expenses, and you're using your savings account to bounce your budget, at some point you've run out of a savings account, and you likely, you know, maybe you have to go through foreclosure for your home, or you know, it's just not a good, healthy way to run your finances. Um, you know, in a school district's case, you really want to try and be balanced budget. Your revenue matches your expenditures. Uh, you know, we've always had some type of use of fund balance built in because uh, typically we have a decent amount of turnover in staff. Uh, you want to optimistically budget the expense all the way to the expectation of 100% staffing. Uh, but the realization is you do have turnover and, and savings. Uh, from the curriculum side, the argument would be it's not savings because of the amount of money we invest in, in our staff to train them. Um, but the most simplistic way to look at it is your own, your own personal finances. You, you never want to bounce your budget with a savings account, uh, and that's pretty much what your fund bounce is. So eventually, if it runs out, you can no longer bounce your budget. Thank you. Superintendent McGarry. Thank you, Ms. Buford. Um, Craig, first of all, thank you for your efforts, you know, like Christine and, and, um, and Marshlack, I know the hours that you put into this on top of everything else that you're managing and all the projects and the, and the funding of those projects and um, bonds that we're, we're issuing. I know you've got a tremendous amount of pressure and stress and to your team, thank you very much. I don't want to go back and forth over these three comments, but I do think it's my responsibility to let the public and this, you know, keep the board who's actively involved in this and, and Ms. Mitchell and, and Board President Brown and, Ms. Curry and all the members of this team are involved in the fair funding issues, but I do want to point out three particular items that continue to would plague the Upper Darby School District. Vouchers and the voucher process, the uncertainty and where that's going in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania um, could impact our budgeting. It's an unknown. We don't know where that is, but we have to pass our budget at, at a period of time. Charter school reform. Um, I, for the life of me, I still can't understand when it sounds like every, every time I'm on some kind of a legislative meeting, everybody nods their head yes, that it would make sense to have some kind of charter school reform, in particular a cyber charter school where there could be some at least funding mechanism that's a similar $9,500 per pupil expense. Everybody bobs their head, everybody says yes, and then the next thing I know we're looking at loosening charter schools and making it even easier and, and, and making the process to have charter schools get approved or entry into charter schools less restrictive, and the reform movement goes in the opposite direction. I'm concerned, as the superintendent of Upper Arby School District, that once again, uh, we seem to go in the opposite direction, and that could have a significant impact on our schools, in our district, in our programming, in our budget. Uh, the third part to this is the unknown with uh, Bill you know, 664. Uh, I call it somewhat of a retention bill. Um, and special education for other students, this idea that they can repeat another school year, I'm concerned about the unknown financial impact that will have on our school districts that we're having to pass a budget with those three unknowns. Um, I don't want that to cloud your efforts or the efforts of this board who continue to um, push all of us to do more with less until there is a wake up and recognition that schools should be funded appropriately and Upper Darby should be one of them. But I continue to worry about these unknowns. We pass budgets, we make these decisions, and sometimes, for me, it's like we, we close our eyes and we have three darts, and we're trying to hit that bullseye every single year. And it gets to be very difficult to manage. So, Craig, I really appreciate your efforts, and to this board, I appreciate your efforts. But let's not lose sight of the fact that we are, we are steering the ship every single day, and we're trying to avoid that iceberg. And I just want to keep our eye on that as we, as we move forward. Thank you, Dan. Um, Craig, I guess we can go into policies. So the, the next item, as I had said during my review, is was postponed to next month's meeting. And at this time, I'll hand over the policies that have completed first reading to Mr. Desnoyers. Thank you, Mr. Fields and Mr. Rogers. Just a moment, let me pull up some information. Okay, so as listed on the agenda, there are three policies 
um, being considered with updates this evening. They are policy 800.1, electronic signatures and records. This is a new policy. Policy 816, district social media. This is also a new policy. And policy 916, volunteers, has updated language. Um, so policy 800.1 um, has been recommended for implementation by PSBA. Um, and simply provide some rules and guidelines for um, electronic signatures and, and records in that they are becoming more and more um, commonplace. Uh, the uh, PSBA model policy language is in black text and deletions by the district are in uh, red bold. So the policy outlines guidelines for the use and acceptance of electronic signatures and records in connection with district programs and operations. Um, and it is noted that um, electronic records and uh, signatures have to be maintained um, by the district following uh, state and federal laws and regulations and policy 800 records management. Um, policy moving forward, policy uh, 816 district social media um, is a new, P new PSBA recommended policy. Um, and this one is significant uh, in its length and content and it governs uh, district owned social media accounts. Um, it does uh, have something to say about um, per what it calls, it defines personal social media accounts and it basically says um, this policy only applies to personal social media accounts as far as a K giving the, the, the district the authority um, when necessary to step in um, for district owned, sorry, for personal social media accounts um, when activity in those personal social media accounts um, violates a district policy or law or regulation. Um, so district owned social media accounts, um, this policy uh, authorizes the district to um, approve, create, maintain, and oversee um, social media accounts that are owned by, owned and managed by the district. Um, and there's a, um, and the, 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 it provides guidelines and it, it, um, the policy uh, it delegates to school administration, namely the superintendent um, or uh, delegates, primarily the director of communication, um, the, the actual um, responsibility to um, approve create, manage, and oversee district-owned social media accounts. Um, I should note that there are, um, so um, as far as this policy, uh, dis district-owned social media accounts um, sort of fall into two categories under free speech law. One is a public forum where um, public posting and commenting is allowed and the other is a non-public forum where posting and commenting by the public are not allowed. And so this policy gives um, the administration the authority to um, restrict or disable public posting and commenting. Um, but the, the policy does um, now, as an update from June 1st, uh, will require the administration to um, post a list sort of of the categories of when, where, and how uh, 
posting and commenting, public posting and commenting is disabled. Um, at present, posting and commenting by the public is disabled on one district-owned social media account, and that is on the YouTube platform. A second um, restriction to public posting and commenting is that public posting and commenting is disabled on all district-owned social media accounts for the duration of school board and school board committee meetings. Another category of um, public posting and commenting being disabled is um, on all platforms for any event that is live streamed. Um, so uh, this policy will go through a second reading at the July board meeting. At that time, there will be a new new administrative regulation or AR um, uh, attached to this policy by uh, the administration that lists these categories uh, where uh, public posting and commenting um, is disabled. Um, this information will also be displayed on the appropriate district-owned social media accounts themselves for everyone to see. So that is, that's the, that's the sort of the meat of this uh, policy. Um, as with other PSBA model policies, um, PSBA model policy language is in black and additions and deletions um, uh, by the district are in um, red and green. Um, so moving on to policy 916, volunteers. Um, these are um, administration requested updates um, that uh, clarify uh, certain language in the policy. Um, those clarifications are as follows adding language that specifically prohibits discrimination in the school environment and all district programs for volunteers. Second, the completion of the disclosure statement for volunteers requirement is moved to the certification section. And third, the requirement that all volunteers who are not guest volunteers, one of the categories of district volunteers, uh, submit a federal criminal history report is removed, and um, the, the, the update is that only volunteers who have not been a resident of Pennsylvania during the entirety of the previous 10 years must now submit a federal criminal, criminal history report to become a district volunteer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rogers and Mr. Fields. That completes my uh, report. Thank you, Mr. Snyers. Uh, Craig, uh, um, is there any comment from the board or any comment from the public? Hearing none, I think I send it back to either Craig or Ed. Yeah, I think. Okay, so you asked for about comments from the the board. So there, are, I don't, I don't think there are any. So I then I think check with the Rhonda to see if there's comments from the public. There are no comments from the public. Okay. So now you can have them review the agenda. Okay. Craig, you want to go back over the agenda? Sure. So to the first agenda item tonight was the Eastern Del Delaware County Bicycle Prioritization Study, which was informational. Uh, Mr. Schwartz provided a, an update on the project and, and what's to come. Uh, item number two was the 2021-2022 final budget presentation, which we asked for board action to move this forward uh, to later this evening for the special voting meeting. Uh, I provided an update on the final budget and the changes from the proposed final to the final budget. Uh, item number three, as we've previously discussed, was is postponed until July. 
And then we had policies, which is also board action. Uh, policy 800.1, electronic signatures and records, 816, district social media, 916, volunteer. Uh, and we are looking for board action to move that for a second reading in July. Uh, so for item number two, I ask if the board uh, would like to move forward with the agenda item number two, the 2021-2022 final budget. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. And then the three policies? Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay, I think that covers everything. Thank you very much, Mr. Fields, for facilitating it. the uh, Finance and Operations Committee meeting. A motion is in order for the adjournment of the Finance and Operations Committee meeting. So moved. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, meeting is adjourned. We'll take five before we start our special meeting. Thank you.
Welcome back to the special meeting to adopt the 2021-2022 budget. The special meeting for the adoption of the 2021-2022 final budget and any other matters brought before the board shall come to order. I would like to note that all board members previously polled tonight are still present. The instruction and curriculum report, Mrs. Carey. Thank you, Board President Brown. The instruction and curriculum report is in the hands of each board member and has been made available to the public. I move for its adoption. Second. Are there any comments from the board? I have a comment. I'd just like to say um, before we um, vote that um, it's been a long time coming with um, all the changes that have gone through with um, COVID restrictions and now that things are moving along, I just, it felt good to read um, some of the reports and some of the things that were being um, lifted and changed. So that's all I wanted, just to make that comment. Thank you. Are there any other comments from the board? Hearing none, Ms. Buford, are, are there any comments from the public? President Brown, there are no comments from the public. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. Those opposed, please signify by saying I oppose and state your name for the record. Those abstaining, please signify by saying I abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carries. The transportation report, please, Ms. Williams. The transportation report is in the hands of each board member and has been made available to the public. I move for its adoption. Second. Thank you. Are there any comments from the board? Hearing none, Ms. Buford, are there any comments from the public? There are no comments from the public. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying I oppose and state your name for the record. Those abstaining, please signify by saying I abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carried. The facilities, the use of facilities, and the donation reports, Mr. Fields. The facilities, the use of facilities, and the donation reports are in the hands of each board member and have been made available to the public. I move for their adoption. Second. Thank you. Are there any comments from the board? Board President, one comment from me. Yes. Uh, special thanks to, uh, for the donation of uh, soccer goals to Hillcrest Elementary from uh, Ted Farmer. Uh, who is part of the Upper Derby Football Club. And that's my only comment. Thank you. He actually coached my son in soccer, so thank you, Mr. Farmer. Uh, are there any other comments from the board? Director O'Neill. Okay, please. Um, well, Director O'Neill is here. I'm not sure if uh, where O'Neill Excuse me, I was just emailing <laughs> Kristen O'Neill. I apologize. <laughs> Um, my, my question is regarding the Upper Darby Township request to use um, the baseball field for the July 4th fireworks. They have it selected as 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Um, are, are they setting up, like, where are they setting up the, the fireworks? Um, are they doing that earlier in the day? Is that going to impact any other events that is uh, possibly on the field because they did not put in uh, the time to set up? Dr. Board, Gary. Sure, thank you. Board Member Neal, I'll, I'll certainly reach back out to the township with uh, Craig Rogers and Marvin Lee, but my understanding is, is that they're bringing in a company, although we've had reports that we can put them off near the football field where they normally are, the, the firework company said that they don't want to be near the football field putting them off because of the turf field. So they're moving the firework display to where the baseball field area is located. We will certainly check to make sure that that's enough time for them to be able to set up and uh, make this happen. We don't foresee that being an interruption anyway, but we'll definitely check to make sure. Craig, you want to add anything? Yeah, the only thing I'll add is uh, Marvin and our facilities team have met with the township and the contractor uh, last week. They reviewed the plan, they reviewed the site, uh, and came up with, with a plan, and then over, over the weekend they had put this request in. So uh, to Dr. McGarry's point, we'll absolutely follow up and, and double check the time uh, to make sure that that is okay. But. I do know that they've already met on site and, and formulated a plan. 
Okay, awesome. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McGarry. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Are there any other comments from the board? Okay, hearing none. Ms. Buford, are there any comments from the public? There are no comments from the public. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying aye oppose and state your name for the record. Those abstaining, please signify by saying I abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carried. The Finance and Budget Report, Dr. Hay. Thank you, President Brown. The Finance and Budget Report is in the hands of each board member and has been made available to the public. I move for its adoption. Second. Are there any comments from the board? Hearing none, Ms. Buford, are there any comments from the public? There are no comments from the public. Thank you. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, please signify by saying aye oppose and state your name for the record. Those abstaining, please signify by saying I abstain and state your name for the record. The motion carried. We are now at the time for the public hearing. We will read both emailed and phone comments which are subject to the three minute time limit and must include the commenter's name and address. Mrs. Buford. President Brown, there are no comments for this evening. Thank you very much. Okay, a motion is in order for the adjournment of the meeting. So moved. Second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Good night. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Aye. Have a good night. All right.